Well, good afternoon to everybody. I think I'm gonna hide in the corner a little bit so I can see everybody. I, um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy that you all have taken time out of your schedule to come and be with us. We, um, we did our first Bible school in, I think, 2016, and then in 18, and then we skipped some time, and now here we are, our third City on a Hill Bible School. And every time we've done this, it's been, it's been a blessing. It's been a blessing for those of us that are here, for the church, and I think for people who have come. So I'm glad that you were willing to come all the way out here from wherever you came from. Um, if you don't know me, uh, I'm Matthew Milioni. I... I, uh, Finney Curvella and I and one other family started Followers Away here in Boston in 2013. And um, I have 12 children. I actually, um, since I have all of your attention and a captive audience, I'd like to actually recruit your help. My wife and part of my family is away in Oregon right now. My brother-in-law was just diagnosed with fourth stage cancer. And so she went out there to go be with her brother and, and help him figure out treatment and things. So if you, would, if you would think of my family and kind of the work it is for us to put together Bible school and do teaching and stuff, I, I really covet your prayers for Josh, my brother-in-law, uh, and his, um, his cancer diagnosis and that God would work in that family. My prayer has been, in the time since Erica has gone back there, is that God would use sickness to create wholeness, to create whole health for him and his family and Erica's whole family. So that would be a blessing to me if you would make that a matter of prayer for you as well. I know that you guys will be spending some time in prayer, so. We, we picked the, um, the subject of discipleship as the focus of the week and I feel like <clears throat> disciple is one of those words that has been cliched and caricaturized by its use. It's such a common word within Christian religious circles that we don't often take time to stop and think about what we're implying when we use the term disciple. And in fact, we don't actually use it a whole lot anymore. In fact, I think it's probably much more common for us to call ourselves Christians than to call ourselves disciples of Jesus, although nobody would be surprised to use that terminology. It's not the first thing that jumps out of our mouth when we describe our identity. But it is appropriate in a historical analysis of looking at the Gospels and what happens when Jesus establishes his church to call those people disciples of Christ. And so it's appropriate for us too. And we want to look at some of what it means in these sessions throughout this week. We want to look at what it means, how to be a disciple. What, and so today, where we'll start with that is talking about what does that word mean? What is that relationship that we're describing when we use the term disciple? Um, my... My teaching is not always super linear. It's a little more stream of consciousness. I would encourage you to take notes. If you hear something that's interesting to you that I talk about, write it down and let me know, and I, we can follow up, and I'd love to have more conversations about these things as we go. So let's start by, um, let's, let me start with another announcement. Here's the thing. I coveted this particular session because I don't like mornings. And so I was very eager to have the afternoon session, and it's, it's good for me and it's good for my life. But, um, but after lunch is when everybody's tired. So if I see people getting tired, we're going to have to stand up and do something. So stay with me. Uh, if you need to, hey, and don't feel bad. If you're feeling tired, stand up and stand up against the wall, walk around the back. That's not distracting to me at all, especially after lunch. Just keep yourselves alert so that we're all on the same page. And don't, don't hesitate to do that if you need. Get up and get some water. It won't distract me. I'm, I'm pretty resilient as far as that is concerned. So let's all be alert this week in this time, especially later in the week. It gets longer and longer. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time and this place and these meetings and the the desire and commitment that all of these people have made to be here in this place. Father, we've come specifically to 
lean into the word of God and to ask you to speak to us, to teach us, to show us things about ourselves and about the world around us and about who you are. I pray, Father, that you would use this time, that it wouldn't be a waste for anyone, that you would use me and use all these brothers and sisters to make your kingdom grow. We ask for your grace in this place and especially your spirit to be present. In Jesus' name, amen. So what is a disciple? Let's start there. My functional definition for a disciple How do you define this word? Well, you know, the, you can break it apart. Disciple comes from discipline, right? So the disciplines, someone who follows the disciplines of a teacher is the most technical definition of a disciple. So you could be a disciple of Buddha. You could be a disciple of Jesus. You could be a disciple of Muhammad. You could be a disciple of Joe. You could be a disciple of Bill. You could be a disciple. Anybody who lays out a pattern of disciplines, you could be a disciple of the U.S. military. You could be a disciple of a lot of things. We usually put it in a kind of religious term, but it means to follow the disciplines of. So there's something implied already just in the language itself, that there's something to follow, right? But functionally, I'm going to say a disciple is one, for our purposes, one who allows Jesus access to his whole self. Now that definition matters for our purposes and we'll appeal to it throughout this week. I'll, I'll, I'll try to defend that definition as we go. But what it means is that the disciple is the person who says Jesus can have access to everything. To my mind, to my heart, to my life, to my ambitions, to my possessions, that he gets access. And the reason that I want to start with our definition here is because what we have recorded in the scriptures, and you can turn, we, we have a few texts that we'll look at today. They're fairly small. But Matthew chapter 4 is when Jesus calls his first disciples. And we'll look there. It's in the 18th verse is where it starts. But, but what happens in all of the cases where Jesus calls people to be his disciple is that every time he's disrupting something about their life, he's getting in the way of the course of life that they were following and saying, leave that and come here. That's the most important point I want to make today, is that the disciple is someone who was on a course of life, they run into Jesus, and he says, stop doing that, and come over here with me and follow me. I'm going to take you somewhere else. And the people that say yes to that proposition are disciples, and the people who say no to that proposition are not disciples. Regardless of what they say, regardless of what they call themselves, the real definition of a disciple is someone who meets Jesus in their life, and he says, I want you to quit doing that and start doing this. And I think if you think through all of the places where we see Jesus running into people, that fits every, every, every occasion where Jesus is interacting with people and calling them to, the, to, to his gospel and his kingdom. If you think of, let's, let's, um, let's look at Matthew chapter 4. Let's just read through this. In verse 18, he says this, the, this Matthew says this. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother, in a ship with, with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. I've read this story since I was a little child reading Bible storybooks, and I took a long time to realize the impact of exactly what happens in that little few verses. 
Finney, in his book, if you've read his book, talks some about the issue of strong group and weak groups. Is anybody familiar with those concepts? Okay, these are, these are kind of anthropological terms, and they, have, they describe societies, and there's a way that you can evaluate social groups to see whether how strong they are or how weak they are, and it has to do a lot with the value of the individual in relation to the collective. And so tribal groups are very collectivist. You, your identity is not so much your specific individual self, but who you are in relation to your father and your tribe and your people that your identity is primarily about where you fit in the cultural order, not who you are as a person. So that's the distinction between weak groups and strong groups. And if anything is a strong group, it's certainly ancient Hebrews. Like, think of, think of all the tribal conversations that happen in the Old Testament and how you're supposed to marry people from your tribe, you're supposed to define the borders of your tribe, your land, your father, your identity is all tied together with who you are as a people primarily. And individualism is not really the concept that we all have grown up with as 20th century Americans, 21st century Americans. Westerners, post-enlightenment people. We, we come from a weak group and we'll talk some more about that. The reason for bringing it up here now is that the idea of telling two sons who are in their father's boat doing his work, that a man would walk by and say to a man's sons, come and follow me, leave what you're doing with your dad, quit doing what he's telling you to do, and come and follow me, is absolutely preposterous. It's ludicrous. There's no sense in which that's a normal thing to do. And whatever was happening in, in Peter and Andrew and James and John's life, whatever they knew about Jesus up to that point, at that moment when Jesus says, come and follow me, what's at stake is their whole identity, their whole purpose, their whole reason for being the way they see themselves in the world, in the context of their families, their tribes, their nation, their, their relation to God, all of that identity stuff is leveraged against Jesus, this one person, this teacher. Now, they don't know anything about the resurrection. They don't know about the Sermon on the Mount. They don't know what he said. They don't know, as far as we know, they don't know any of these things. They just see him. And something about him is more compelling than their whole sense of identity. And this is the beginning framework for what a disciple is. That the, what's leveraged is your understanding of your identity and a call to become something new. It's not a small thing. And we're left to speculate, right? What did they see about Jesus? What was so compelling about him? Matthew Levi does the same thing. He's sitting at a table full of money. That, that money is symbolic. It's not just the money that was right there on the table that, that Levi walks away from. In these territories, you know, um, the way that the Romans collected taxes was uh, they, would have these, they would have these contracts, and they would send out bids for a contract to collect taxes within a certain region. And it was very, very competitive. Uh, you can read about this in a book called uh, Faith and Wealth by Justo Gonzalez. He talks some about the economics of these situations. Um, but they would, they, would, they would hand out contracts for a certain term to collect taxes within a certain area. And you had to, be very, you had to buy that contract. And, and you were required to provide back, to, the, back to, the, to Rome the amount that was supposed to be collected for that area. But you would, whatever you levied over the cost of the contract was yours to keep. So if you owed, you know, just pick some numbers, if you owed a million dollars back to Rome, if you could collect $2 million in taxes, well then you're a million dollars richer for the contract. And that's why people would bid for them. And then they would become the enforcers for, Rome didn't have to send their armies, they would, the, all these little private tax collecting armies would rise up and they'd hire soldiers and they'd, you know, shake people down for the money and, you know, check people's names off the lists. And they could, they could kind of do whatever they want. And Rome certainly wasn't going to get in the way of what they wanted to do because Rome wanted their money. 
And so this is why the, the tax collector is such a villain in the narrative that we read, because he's a traitor. Like, if you're a Jew working for, the, for, for Caesar, like, you're already a bad guy. But then you're also extorting your own people. And this is who Levi is. So when you see Levi leaving the receipt of custom, leaving the table of money, it's not just that table of money. It's his participation in this whole traitorous system. His whole identity, like he's sell, he sold out everyone he knows. He's the villain of the town. He's the, he's the hated, despised person. Nobody wants to be near him. They walk to the other side of the road when he comes around. And now this guy comes up, this teacher comes up and says, leave all that and come and be with me. And just like the sons of Zebedee, just like Peter and Andrew, that's a preposterous claim. That's a, that's a crazy thing to ask. My fear and my concern is that for all of us who grew up in the church, we've lost sense of what this call is really supposed to be doing. That it's supposed to be creating us new. It's supposed to be challenging the who you are to be something else. Because I wasn't, that wasn't how it was talked about when I was young. In a lot of places that I've been, that's not, the, that's not the way we talk about being a disciple. The immediate implication of all these things is a cost analysis of leveraging your life, your identity, your personality, who you are, what you are, what you want to be, what you're doing, what matters to you, and laying all that on one side of a scale and laying Jesus and his call on the other side of the scale and choosing the Jesus side of that equation. He, you know, here in Boston in the church, we've, we've staked a few doctrinal flags that are a little bit different for our communities of people. One of those has been on adult believers' baptism. And part of the reason why we've staked our flag on that territory is because of this exact issue. Because in order to properly follow Jesus as a disciple, you have to have something on your side of the scale. Like you have to know what that is. It has, to, it has to be meaningful that you have some sense of identity and personhood and autonomy and, and, and values and, and desires on, that you're leveraging those pieces of who you are against what Jesus is calling you to be. And if you don't know what that is, if you haven't developed it, if you haven't had the space in your life to know who you are, what you are, what you want, what you're going to be, what you're doing, what you want to do, like hopes, ambitions, dreams, all those things, if you haven't uh, temptations, sins, lusts, desires, if you haven't developed those things, they can't properly be leveraged in contrast to what Jesus is calling you to. And so having some sense of personhood and identity and knowing what you are that's being called away from that to Jesus is an essential piece of what it means to be a disciple. When, when I became a disciple, I had just gotten married. So I was raised in in uh, the evangelical church, in the Baptist church. My grandfather's a Baptist preacher. Um, <clears throat> and I, I, I grew up with, this, with sinner's prayer stuff, like baptized at five years old, grew up in the church, very faithful family in the Baptist context, you know, in, in the church three times a week. Dad was on the school board and usher and trustee and deacon and all those things. Very, very committed and involved in our, our church life. So I grew up in, in, in the evangelical world. And, you know, in those circles, discipleship is reduced to um, it's reduced. How do I say this without being too confrontational? I, I think my experience is that it's reduced to a mantra. 
is reduced to a mantra. You know what a mantra is? A mantra is a thing that you say in Eastern religions. You repeat them, like om, om, like people repeat these things. Discipleship is reduced to a mantra in many corners of the evangelical world. And that mantra is, I, I repent of my sins and ask Jesus into my heart. If you say that, if you mean that, then that means you're a Christian. And I grew up functionally believing that the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian, between a heathen and a believer, was whether or not you accepted the premise that Jesus was the Son of God in the flesh, that he lived a perfect life, that he died on the cross for your sins, and he rose again the third day. If you said yes to that statement, you were a Christian. If you said no to that statement, you were a heathen. That's the defining terms of Christianity. That's what a disciple was, was somebody who believed that these things were true, that Jesus died on the cross for his sins. That was very uninformed. That's, there's lots and lots and lots of problems with that. But when I actually became a disciple, I had lived already on, on the streets for quite a few years with my girlfriend, soon to be wife, in 1998. We got married in the summer and through some radical supernatural experiences, my wife began to entertain the idea of being a Christian. Now, in all those years, I, I claimed that I was a Christian I, I, because I believed that I never didn't believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and rose again on the third day. Like, that was a fact, and so I was a Christian. And so my whole life of living in sin and debauchery and drunkenness and violence, those were all done under the terms of being a Christian. But my wife didn't have that experience. She didn't come from that world. In fact, one of the times we had, we had been involved in a bunch of crazy stuff that happened, it was one of the times when I, I know that our lives were really genuinely in peril. Um, after we escaped that event later that night, she said to me, what would have happened tonight if we died? And I said, well, I would have gone to heaven and you would have gone to hell. She's like, well, how does that make sense? Like, why is that fair? And I said, well, it's because I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and you don't. And she's like, well, that's stupid. <laughs> we live the same way. We die the same way. We're in the same fight, in the same situation. And you, you get to go to heaven and I go to hell? I said, yeah. And she said, well, that is stupid. And I said, no, you're stupid. <laughs> why wouldn't you just say, why wouldn't you just ask Jesus into your heart and you go to heaven too? Like, you're the dumb one, not me. <laughs> but she was right. That is stupid. I didn't, I didn't realize, and that's probably one of the first chinks in the armor, like that I had developed of my own, you know, conditioning and indoctrination. It was one of the first times that I, that, even no matter what I was saying, I started to not believe myself. So now, fast forward a little bit, and we've just got married. All this stuff starts happening with Erica, and for the first time, I'm seeing, I'm seeing her change. I'm seeing her change because of things that God's doing in her life. And for all of my time in the church... I hadn't, now we were door knocking Baptists. We were fundamentalists, independent Baptists. Like, we were not casual Baptists. We would door knock, we would invite people to church, we would do all this stuff. But I had never actually known somebody, all the people who I knew in my wor religious world who, who were Christians had always been Christians. Like, I, that's all I knew. I mean, I had heard of maybe some of the old people in church used to be like Hell's Angels or something, but I didn't know, I'd never seen any, a life changed because of obedience to Christ. All that I knew were people who were in the church, from the church, to the church, by the church. They were all like me. They all grew up there, and they were Christian in identity like we were American in identity, like I was a Millionian identity, like it was a part of who you were born to be more than a choice that you made. And here for the first time in my life, my wife is starting, my brand new wife, we we're just kids, but she's starting to be a different person than she used to be. And this is novel. This is something different. She's changing in real and perceivable ways. And in the, in the course of our interaction, you know, there's lots I could tell about that story. I've told it plenty of times before. What, what the defining moment for me was, 
When I came home from work one night, Erica said, we used to talk about the scriptures. Before we had children, we would, I would come home from work. She, she quit working when we got married. And I would come home from work, and we'd sit and have supper, and she would ask me questions about the Bible. I'm still not a Christian, but I grew up in the church. Like, I think I'm a Christian, but I'm not. And she would ask me questions about the Bible because she didn't, she, she came from a broken home, a single mother, like she didn't have any exposure to the Bible, the church was all brand new to her. In fact, when she first started reading the Bible, she read all the way through Matthew, and then she read all the way through Mark, and then she read all the way through Luke, and she was like, I came home and she was like, Matthew, is the Bible just the same story like over and over again? Like where, how many times do, does this happen? And I was like, no, read Romans, like there's other stuff there. So she wanted to know things, and that was part of the change. Like, why, would, why did this girl with a seventh grade education all of a sudden want to read the Bible? But that's what she would do. Like, before, we, before these things happened to Erica, she would sit and she would, she would day drink and watch soap operas and be lonely. Now I'm going to work and she wants to sit and read her Bible. She's, she's turned off the TV. She's quit drinking. Like, there's different stuff that's happening. And, <clears throat> and so one night when I come home, she says... I want, to, I want to ask you some questions, and I, she hands me this notebook as we're reading supper, and in it, she's written down all these scriptures, and these scriptures that she's written down, like, I know what this, this list constitutes a major amount of work. This is a girl with seventh grade education. She's never read the Bible before. She doesn't know what these funny references in the middle column are about. She doesn't know how to cross-reference. She doesn't know anything about the Bible. She's just reading through. And as she's reading through, she's been writing things down. There's pages of verses that she's written down from the New Testament. And they're all basically, essentially, conversion scriptures. Behold, if any man be in Christ, all things are made new. Children of the light, children of the day. And I read through this whole list of all these conversion scriptures that she's found throughout the New Testament. And I come to the end of the list, and I say, well, what's your question? And she said, I think that something's different about me. And I could never, I just don't feel like I could do the things that we used to do. And I think that's because I'm a Christian. But you did all those things with me, and you were a Christian, and I don't know how that works. And I told her the things that I was taught to tell her. You know, I was backslid, but it's okay. I was baptized. I asked Jesus into my heart. Things are okay. We're going back to church now. It's, it's, it's okay. I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> It was just, I just wasn't living right. But living right isn't what proves that you're a Christian, right? It's that you believe that those things are true. And I I believe those things are true. So it's okay. Don't worry about it. We'll be okay. And, And that was the big chink in the armor. That was the first time I really wasn't convinced. And after that, the, there was this, one particular verse that I read in that list that she had written down, 1 John 1, 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. And this was my gospel call. This was my challenge from God. Was I read that scripture like it was a mathematical equation, and I was the center of the equation. What it meant was, say that we have fellowship with him. Okay, I call myself a Christian. Check that box off. Walk in darkness. I know that I did that. Check that box off. Equals liar. And I spent the next whatever amount of time living every waking hour feeling like there was this neon sign over my head that God had placed there that just flashed liar. Liar, 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 liar. It was there when I woke up. It was there when I went to bed. It was there when I worked. It was every day, all day. It was the only thing I could think about. And as I began to process, I pro- I was, what I was wrestling with, what I was struggling with, was exactly this issue of what is a disciple. Because this is the real thing that's leveraged in my life at that point. Who am I? What am I in relation to Jesus? Am I a disciple? What does it mean to be in Christ? What does it mean to be his? What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a disciple? And the way that I resolved that dilemma in my own life, as I thought and wrestled and agonized over this issue, because the hard thing was this. There were things about my life that I did, that I was able to honestly associate with God. 
I did know things about the scriptures that I believed were true, like in a real sense believed were true. I had had real experiences in my life where I'd been convicted or bothered by my sins or worried about what God thought about things. And I thought to myself, well, if I'm not a Christian, what is all that stuff? What does it mean when those times when I felt like God told me to quit doing something that was wrong? And, and what does it mean that I feel like I should be doing things differently now? And what does it mean that I care about things now that I, that I, that I didn't care about even a few weeks or months or years ago? And I didn't know how to process the religious experiences of my life in terms of my discipleship. And what I resolved at that time is that whatever I've been taught up to this point, everything I've learned in my 20 years that I've been taught in the church that I grew up in, among all the people that I knew and respected and valued, everything that I have been taught up to this point had had exactly zero effect in my life. Like for all the good it did me to be raised a Christian, I might as well have been a Buddhist. But I would have been a much better person if I had been raised a Buddhist. And so whatever I got up to this point must not work. It must not be real. It must have no effect. If it's had no effect in my life and I believed it, then what's the point in believing it? And what I began to what I began to reason in my own mind was that I was sitting at a table, I was looking at a door, and I said, I believe that that door and I believe that this table are made out of wood, but that fact, whether or not it's true, has zero bearing on my life. Like, it, it doesn't matter if the, wood, if the door is wood or if it's fiberglass or if it's metal. It doesn't matter if the table is formica or wood. Like, it, those could be true. It could be true that those are wood and it could have nothing to do with me. And whatever, I've, whatever Christianity is, it has nothing to do with me. Whatever the facts of the case are, they have nothing to do with me. And what I was really struggling with is the fact that I was not a disciple. I hadn't leveraged anything about who I was and my identity and put it on the side of a scale and looked at it in reality and said, I would rather him than that. That's why throughout the, the gospel... All of this stuff is leveraged in repentance. It's not about behavior modification. I mean, it is. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an antecedent. It's what comes from this decision. But what's really at stake is evaluating Jesus and his call as higher than everything that I've been able to put to, together in myself, in my identity, in my scope, in my vision, in my hopes and in my dreams, everything that I've been able to muster out of my life without him, I would rather not have that and have him than the alternative. And repentance is exactly that process. That's why, that's why we talk about terms in, repentance in terms of agreeing with God. Like, it's a value proposition. It's saying that Jesus and his kingdom is more valuable than anything I can create without him. What I can do and muster on my own is of less value than who he is. And we call that repentance. What the outcome of all of that for me was, I reasoned to myself, if Christianity is true, if it's not a scam or a lie or a joke, if Christianity is true, then it must be about somebody instead of something. Because I had the something of Christianity. I had the historical facts. I, it didn't even occur to me at that point, although it did later, the devils believe and tremble. Like, they had the good sense to tremble. I believed and didn't tremble. I believed that Jesus was who he said he was. I believed that he died on the cross for my sins. But those facts had no bearing and no impact on who I was. And so I said, if, if Christianity is true then it must be, it must be that it's more than just these facts. It's mu it must be more than a history. It must be more than just saying yes, that you, that you accept that certain historical facts are facts. 
Well, if it's not that, then what is it? And then all the religious terminology that I had grown up with that I thought was just religious talk, these things like personal relationship with Jesus Christ, like knowing Christ, hearing God, talking to God, all these kinds of like interpersonal ways of talking about God in the Christian faith that I thought were just like the way Christian people talked. Like, hey, you know, nobody... Nobody out in the world has a fellowship meal. That's just a Christian thing. That's the way we call that, that nobody else says. It's Christian terminology. Like, there are ways that we talk that are in-house conversations that we know what we mean when we say it, but nobody else does. And I thought this kind of way of talking about Christianity was just that, it's like fellowship meal. Like, it's just a way that Christian people talk. But it's not. It is something and what I said to God at that point was I said, if, if Christianity is real, then I want to know him, not about him. And that's the place where I finally met God. That's the place where Jesus became somebody instead of something. And that process of seeing him and evaluating him is what causes it. It's, it's, it's these experiences. It's sitting in the boat. It's sitting at the receipt of custom. It's having an encounter with Jesus where you can properly evaluate him and say, I want you more than all this other stuff. And that's what makes a disciple. Flip over just a few chapters to Matthew 19. What time does this session end? 2.30? In Matthew 19, in the 16th verse, it says this. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And he saith unto him, Which? And Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. When the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter the kingdom into the kingdom of heaven. And again to say I say unto you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, with God all things are possible. I really appreciate this story being in the narrative because it's the antithesis to Peter and Andrew and James and John, right? Like the thought that, that I would be prone to have is that whoever Jesus like gets in front of and has this personal conversation and says, come and follow me, that people are just so smitten and awed by his physical presence in the world, like he's the God man, right? Like surely there's something, like you have to think there was something about him. like. I, I know Isaiah says, and I, I don't want to be, I don't want to get in the way of scriptures. Isaiah says there's no form nor comeliness that we should desire him. There's nothing about his physical appearance. Like he wasn't the biggest, the strongest, the best looking. He wasn't winsome in his physical features. But I have to believe that there's something, when you had an encounter with Jesus, when you walked by him on the road, there was something about him that you thought, what's, what's, with, what's with that guy? There's something different about him. 
I, I just imagine that's the case. And if it wasn't for these passages, you, I could be tempted to think, well, well, it's Jesus. Like, if Jesus showed up at my boat, I'd go with him too. Like, he had to have been compelling and interesting and awesome and all these things. But here, here, here is the antithesis. Here is somebody coming, and, and it's not this immediate. Like, with, with, with Peter and Andrew, it's straight away. Come and follow. Okay, I'm gone. Here, it's a conversation. Here, it's a little more involved. And here, they're talking about, they're discussing terms. It's much more explicit. Do all this stuff. Okay, I've done that. Okay, here's the thing that you're missing. Why, why the games? Why doesn't it just start there? Have you, do you think about this text that way? Why, why does he bother with that, all the do what the law says? Like it, he was going to a place. We know where he was going. He was going to sell all that you have and give to the poor. Come and follow me. Why didn't he start there? I, I, I don't know, obviously. I can't, I can't say definitively, but I can tell you what I think. I think that the pattern that Jesus lays out is that being a disciple has to be, it has to be, it has to engage your mind and your heart. He doesn't want easy converts. He doesn't want an easy, he doesn't want to overwhelm people. He wants them to think and to be present and to really weigh and evaluate what he's asking. It's like um, a little bit of a rabbit trail. I, I named one of my sons Micaiah. Not Micah, Micaiah. Micaiah's that minor prophet. You remember the story with Ahab. He, pro he actually prophesies Ahab's death. And, and I love Micaiah. He's one of my favorite prophets, even though there's a little tiny story about him. It's, it doesn't take up a lot of text. There's all kinds of crazy stuff that happens in the story of Micaiah. Like things are revealed in heaven in this, this story of this little prophet. It's all we know about this prophet is just this one story. But in this one story, like the scene in heaven is revealed and people are kind of, the sons of God come before him and say, who will deceive Ahab? And I'll go as a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets. And all this, like all this big stuff in, ha in heaven happens in this story. And then when, when Ahab and the king from the north have this conversation, all the prophets come before him and say, go up to Samaria. And, and the, you know, the Belkira, he makes these horns of iron. He says, with horns such as these shall the kings push the push Samaria and like all this theatrics and they get to all those prophets and the king from the north is like mm, is there anybody else and Ahab this is why I named my son this Ahab says yes there is Micaiah but I hate him for he always prophesies evil against me and the king of the north says yeah I want to hear from him and so he sends a servant and the servant goes to his house and he says hey Micaiah come and appear before the kings, all the prophets have spoken well to them. And he says, what I hear, I'll say. So he goes before the kings, and they say, should we go up to Samaria? And he says, yeah, go. And they say, no, prophesy. And he says, I see Israel as, a, as sheep scattered without a shepherd. And he prophesies the destruction of Ahab. And then they throw him into jail. And he says, if, if he's, he's, he says, throw him in jail and feed him the bread of affliction until I return in victory. And he says, if you return in victory, then kill me. Like, this is an intense dude. But that moment where he says, no, prophesy, that's the moment. That's the, that's the moment of truth. Like, I don't want to hear your opinion, Micaiah. I want to get to the substance. I'm going to get, and it, the reason Micaiah says go is because he doesn't want to do that. Like, you don't want to hear what I have to say anyhow. And there's these little glimpses in, into God's, the way that God works with people, where he, he makes it easy. There's an easy out if you want it. Go up to Samaria. Okay, let's go. We've heard from everybody. No, prophesy. That moment, that's the moment that happens right here with Jesus and the rich young ruler. It's exactly what Jesus is doing. The same thing. Like, hey, you want an out? 
Go do the law. You know, you've got Moses. You've been told this stuff. And the rich young ruler says, no, prophesy. No, tell me what I really need to know. Tell me the truth from God. Tell me the, tell me, get to the real heart of the matter. And that's where Jesus says, okay, sell all that you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. And in this, in this evaluation, you have the scales, right? You have the rich young ruler's life and access and wealth and ambitions. And you have Jesus, and he chooses his stuff. And he chooses his life. And for all I know, he continues to do all the other stuff before that moment, he continues to not steal and to honor his fa- mother and father and do all those other things. I don't have any reason to believe that he didn't. And, and he wants to live in this fiction that he's, he's serving God. He's one of God's people. But he knows, he knows that he had this experience and his heart was weighed in the balance and he chose his own way instead of Jesus's. And I think that the main preoccupation of Jesus in his earthly ministry when he was here when he was talking to people and what's been left in this record for me and for you is Jesus continually backing people into a corner and saying do you want to go your way or my way do you want your life or my life and he makes it as clear as it can be and we'll talk about that all this week it means bearing crosses it means leaving father and mother it means all these things it means subjecting your life to his whims and his desires and his direction And all of that he lays out again and again and again. And he's asking everybody there, everybody in front of him, and me and you, which way do you want to go? The Greeks had a saying that said, when the gods are really mad, they give men what they want. And I think about it so much. The, the, the things that are talked about in the scripture where God gives men the desires of their hearts, you know that's a curse and a blessing? That's either the best thing that God will do to you or the worst thing that God will do to you is give you the desire of your heart. Because hearts are deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? The point I'm trying to make here brothers and sisters, is that there, there, there is required, the, to use this term, to say this word, we imply cost. We imply that something was laid out on a scale and you chose one thing instead of another. A disciple means one who chose. The thing, the question that I'm asking in a roundabout way, and I'll say it very clearly now, what did it cost you? I I don't believe, um, I'm I'm a father, and I've since I started having children, one of the things that's been a constant Continual thought, not constant, but continual, is what does it mean for my children to make these decisions? Because like I know it's very easy for me to enumerate what I would be without Christ, because I, I know. I, you all don't know who I was. Like you've never met the me that I am without Jesus. The, the me without Jesus is a destructive, dangerous, violent, unpredictable nasty person. And that's not theoretical. I I know that to be true. But I know it to be true because I lived in a lot of excess and riot and debauchery and, and, and horrible things. But what does it mean? What does it mean to not go that route? What does it mean to evaluate Christ versus my life when it's not in the context of having lived the fullness of manifesting all those things that you are. 
I thought many, many times, I've spent a lot of my mental space and energy thinking about what is this going to mean? Because I don't want my children to live the way I lived. I don't want them to go through the things that I went through. I don't want them to have to run into the gutter and live in filth to be able to know what it is that Jesus is asking them to be a disciple. I don't want that. I don't want it for anybody. I don't want it for me, but here we are. And I think there's a few different ways to think about this. What I'm saying is that I'm not saying I'm not trying to I'm not trying to talk about like this crisis salvation experience that everybody has to be, you know, like slaughtering a pig and a satanic sacrifice and go, oh, this is bad. I want to be a Christian. I'm not saying that we need to live in sin to really commit our lives to Christ. I don't believe that's true. I actually don't even think it's normal. I think that God's normal plan is that we understand these things in the context of of a, a guided home and a guided church life that allows us to understand who we are without having to fulfill all those lusts. But if you don't realize that the, if you don't realize your capacities, if you haven't seen your shadow, if you don't know what you could be, then I worry about what have you staked on the scale? What does it cost you? The thought exercise is this. What would you be if you weren't a Christian? Like, what would your life be like? Let's just pretend for the moment that God doesn't exist and you're sure that's true, that the gospel is false, there's nothing to this, Jesus was just a man if he lived it all, and none of this is true. If you were sure that that was the case, what would your life be like? What would you do and be? Where would you go? How would you set up your life? What would matter to you? What wouldn't matter to you? Would you... What would define your behavior and your thoughts? What would guide you? What would you be left all to your own? If you were left all alone in the world, what would you be? Another way to ask the question is, what are you choosing not to be to follow Jesus? See, the message that Jesus sends out, and I I wasn't at Charlton's message. Sorry, brother. So I, I, I'm, I can guess some of the things that he said, because I know Charlton, I love him. I, I can guess that if you didn't today, you're going to talk about what the terms of the gospel are in the context of the kingdom. The kingship of Jesus is what we're being called to. It's, 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 it's about him personally, Jesus himself. That's what's on the other side of the scale. When we weigh our life and when we're, when we're in the crux of discipleship, when, when we're choosing what to give up and what not to be and what to be to follow him, it's in the terms of the gospel. And that, that is, mm, it's hard for me to talk about Jesus in the kingdom, what we're being called to, if, without the concept of logos. You all know, I hope, that logos is the Greek word that's translated in your Bible most often as word, W-O-R-D. Logos is, if you read the early church, it's a very, very, very common term. 
It's what they say of the, it's the, one of the most common titles that they call Jesus if they don't use his name Jesus. And in the English, it's translated W-O-R-D. And the reason it's translated word, it's an appropriate translation. The reason it's translated word is because it comes from this idea of, of manifesting a thought. Like something's in your mind and you put it out into the world, and that's a word, right? Like what is a word? What are the things that I'm saying right now? They originate as thoughts in my head, and through my voice, they become something real in the world. They move from the interior to the exterior. That's, that's why this word logos is translated word, because that's the idea that this comes from. It's manifesting a thought into the real world. But what does that mean in terms of Jesus? Why is Jesus the logos of God? Well, you have this stuff in, in the Proverbs where, where we, we generally think that Jesus is the creative power. Like when, and when it says in, in Genesis, in the beginning was the word, I mean, uh, and, and God spoke. When he said, let there be light, that logos, that speaking, that manifestation of God's will is Christ. So Christ is the creative power of God. He's wisdom personified. He's the creative force of God in the Psalms. All that's kind of complicated theology, but just take my word for it. What, the reason we use logos for Jesus, the reason it's a title, the, the, the early church, the Greek-speaking church and the Latin-speaking church is using this as a title for Jesus, like his name, because Jesus is the manifestation of God's idea. He is, like, so when God thinks, what could a man be? What could a man be? If I conceptualize a man, what could he be? And that's logos. The incarnation, the manifestation of God in the flesh is the logos. It's God's concept of what a man could be being lived out in reality. Just like my words, if I express them well, are taking my ideas and putting them into the world so that they can be seen and known. Jesus is the manifestation of God's idea of what we could all be. That's why he's Logos. So often when I talk about this, what I, the, the imagery I use, I like art. And I like Renaissance art in particular. And one of my favorite pieces of Renaissance art is the Sistine Chapel. So the Sistine Chapel has many famous pieces, but one of them is like the, 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 the painting of where God is reaching out and his fingers extended and Adam is reclining. Like that, that you know, do you all know that picture? You know, God, the creation of Adam. That's in the Sistine Chapel. There's a bunch of panels in the chapel. There's a bunch of prophets in, in the chapel. It's beautiful, beautiful. I, I'd love to see it one day outside of pictures. Anyhow. Michelangelo's an interesting dude. This fantastic artist. He wasn't actually even, he didn't consider himself a painter. He was a sculptor. But I think about what is it like. So, so the other famous Michelangelo, another famous Michelangelo piece is the statue of David. You know, this giant statue of David. It's, these are masterpieces. You know, these are exquisite. They're like the pinnacle of artistic expression of the Renaissance. And, and that, that David or that Sistine Chapel started as a blank slate. It started as a rock or a ceiling. And at some point, Michelangelo conceptualizes what that could be. He sees a giant stone of marble, but inside that giant stone of marble, he sees the statue of David. He sees what that could be. He sees what the ceiling could contain, and he does his sketches. He sees it in his mind. I can just imagine he goes and he lays down on the floor of the Sistine Chapel, and he gets down, you know, and he looks up and he says, okay, that's what I got to work with. And he gets up and he goes back to his workshop and he jots down all these pictures and he plans out and he schemes and he measures, and then he gets to work. And in, in, in um, frescoes, the way it works is that you, you put, a fresco isn't on the wall, it's in the wall. So you make wet mud and you do about six square feet of mud, plaster you put on the wall, and then you paint in the wet mud. And as the mud dries, the paint becomes a part of the wall. So he would do six feet at a time, about. 
He would mix up his paints. These are horribly toxic chemicals. They're imported from all over the world. He's got his formulas, and every morning he's down there with his cauldrons and making his paints and making his pigments and putting everything together. And he goes over, puts it, lays down, and he was a crank. He was so moody about this. He hated every day. He always complained about his back hurting from being on the scaffolding, all this stuff. But he does it, and he works, and he works, and he works for years. And finally, finally, at a certain time, he goes and lays down back on the floor where he was at the beginning. And he looks up, and what's on the ceiling matches what was in his mind. And that, conceptually to me, is logos. The idea being made real. And that is why Jesus is the logos of God. He's the manifestation of God's ideal. The scriptures say this in certain terms. They say, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That speaks to his divinity. But he also is the son of man. I want to stay on track. This matters because we're talking about what's on the other side of the scale of, of the question, the, pro, the, the proposition of being a disciple. What is it that we're selling out our lives for? What is it that we're giving up our self and our identity and our desires and ambitions for? What's worth doing that? Hey, it's not a small thing. There's... There's not sure things in life. I don't know what's going to happen tonight or tomorrow. Neither do you. One thing that's been more clear to me is that things have happened since 2019, 2020 that I thought would never happen in America. I, I, there's all kinds of possible outcomes that things that could be happening in the next minute or hour or day or week or month or year that I have no idea. There are no sure bets. Life, because of its fragility, because of its unpredictability, is precious and valuable. And the life that you make, what you're making of your life, it's not a little thing for God to ask you to give that up, to follow Jesus. In fact, it should be the opposite. It should mean a lot. It should mean everything. Everything is at stake. You know, I, I, I talk about this proposition of discipleship in terms of all the brokenness that I was, but I had other stuff too. I was very broken. I was destroying things, and I know the outcome of my life would have been destructive, but I wasn't, I was doing things I wanted to do. I was king of my own world. I was master of my own self. I did what I want, when I wanted, how I wanted, where I wanted, why I wanted. That kind of freedom and autonomy is available. You can't avoid the consequences of it, but you can live exactly how you want to live. And that's not a small thing to give up. In fact, it's everything to give up. Why should we do that? Why should we surrender our autonomy? Why should we surrender our identity? Why should we be something different than we are? Well, there's two reasons. Those outcomes I talked about, when you do things your own way, because we're not God, because we're broken, because we, our motives are skewed and our s lusts and desires drive us and compel us because we live in a broken world, because of sin and its consequences, things don't usually work out when you do it yourself. But the other reason is who the Logos is. We talked about that. I just mentioned the strong group and the weak group stuff. I, 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 I'm, what, I, what I think happens, I'm kind of a fan of the Enlightenment. Like, I like modern liberalism, humanism, you know, the value of the individual, I think is a good thing. When I think about living in, in an ancient setting, in a strong group culture, you, you don't matter in that world like you do here. 
your thoughts, like they exist in a little tiny bubble that you're supposed to suppress in many, many ways. Like you're just supposed to do what's done. Like the idea of original thought, the idea, there's, there's certain concepts that we have in the post enlightenment world that we take for granted. Henry David Thoreau is one of my favorite authors, and he said, he, two of my favorite quotes from him is that, any man more right than his neighbor constitutes a majority of one. What he's saying is that being right is not synonymous with being majority. And that's kind of a new thought. The prophets in the Old Testament are making an appeal to some kind of individualistic thought in the context of a strong group. But they're anomalies, and they're hated, and they're despised, and they're rejected, all these things, because they're in this very strong group culture. To have one prophet saying one thing different than everybody else is not well received. But in this world, in the post-Enlightenment Western world, we have concepts that an individual can be right even when his whole family or his whole community or his whole neighborhood or his whole nation is wrong. And there's something that we do where we value ideas apart from the consensus. And that, that has some good merits to it. There's some things to be said for why we live in a weak group culture. They're, it's not all bad. That isn't a value judgment. Strong group and weak group is just a definition of how the culture thinks about itself. It's not a, it's not a value proposition. There are some good things about strong groups and there are some good things about weak groups. What I think happens, what I see Jesus doing in a strong group culture is breaking those strong group associations and putting them back together in a different context. And I think that he probably does the exact same thing to you and me. He's breaking our weak group concepts. He's breaking the idea of the individual. If he's breaking the idea in Andrew and Peter and James and John, if he's breaking the collective idea of family and tribe and saying, I want to take you out of that. I want you to, I want you to risk that. I want you to put it on the altar. And I'm going to put you together in a different collection. I'm going to make you a different kind of family. You're going to call each other brother and sister now. You're going to call each other mother and father. Who is my mother and who are my brethren but they that do the will of my father. There's a new concept of strong group to be reconnected as Jesus breaks these associations in these people's lives. He says, father isn't most important. Nation isn't most important. The priest isn't the most important. There's something else and I'm going to remake you into a new group. He does the same thing in an individualistic, weak group society. He says, I know that your ideas are important to you. I know that individualism is important to you. Can you submit that to the collective? Can you become a part of a people? Can you surrender yourself your ideas, your concepts, and blend yourself into the people of God. Can you Americans, you 21st century Americans, can you collect yourselves together to be the people of God? That's the question. That's a question for us. It's a part of what it means to be a disciple today. And it's why we're so eager to break this idea that the gospel is about you. It's not about you. Do you know what the centerpiece of the gospel is? It is not you going to heaven. It is not you being forgiven of your sins. That is not the centerpiece of the gospel. The centerpiece of the gospel is Jesus has come as Messiah to establish the nation of God on earth. That's the centerpiece of the gospel. That's what it's about. It is about, aside from you. That's the gospel. Now, if we grant that, would you like to be a part of that? Would you like to join that? That's the message of the gospel. And the disciples are those people who are willing to break whatever needs to be broken and to reattach to what God's doing in the world. The thing is, Jesus and the kingdom have to be the center of the devotion. There's a lot of... There's a lot of secondary things that become primary in our lives, and this is a danger. Let me explain why. I asked that question, what would you be 
if you if it if it weren't for Jesus? And it's an important question to ask. But I think I think that if if we actually ran that thought experiment in in a, in a cohesive kind of way, you might be surprised with what some of the answers are. Because I dare say that if I pulled the church, the conservative church, a lot of people, even if Jesus didn't exist, would live very similar lives. Because there's cultural associations, there's, you know, we, do, we, ha, we have groups of, we think in certain ways, and we're attached in certain relationships that even if Jesus didn't exist would still be there. And so there's a lot of secondary reasons for doing the things that we do. You know, to fit in with your culture, to fit in with your people, to be in harmony with your family. There's a lot of reasons why we do the things that we do. To be, to, to feel like you're a good person or to have some sense of moral ethics and codes. There's a lot of reasons. Think about it this way. Why do, why, why do Muslims practice the ethics and the morals that they practice? Let's assume that we're right and that that's a false God, that Allah is not God, that Islam is not true, that Muhammad was not the prophet of the one true God. It's, I mean, we're, we're all staking our claims there by calling ourselves Christians, so let's just call it what it is. Let's assume that's false. Why do those people act that way? If it's not true, like in reality, in the cosmos, in the ultimate truth, it's not true that Allah is God and Muhammad is his prophet, why are those people acting that way? Well, there's a lot of reasons. There's a culture, there's a religion, there's a tradition, there's a value, there's all kinds of things why those people act that way, why they give to the poor, why they don't steal, why they don't murder, why don't they commit fornication, why they don't drink, why they don't get drunk, all these things that they do. Why, they do those things because there's other reasons. And there are for us too. There's lots of reasons in our culture, in, in our groups for why we behave the way we do that aren't primarily attached to Jesus' identity. Here's where that matters. If the way we're living our life isn't rooted in our devotion to Christ, and it's some other blend or mix of motives, it's really hard to act like a disciple. Because for the disciple, Jesus is at the center. And what, what I'm fixing my life on is him him, himself, the Logos. This is where I want my focus to be. This is what I want to learn from. This is what I want to be like. This is what I want to understand. This is what I want to meditate on. This is what I want to be. But if you shift that focus, then he loses access to correct your path. And you're doing things for other reasons. You're doing things for the community. You're doing things for the collective. You're doing things for tradition. You're doing things for ideology. You're doing things for a lot of things. And where our motives are rooted in ideology or culture or self or some other thing, that's a place where Jesus doesn't have access. That's why he's trying to get to the root of the rich young ruler. It's why he calls, he's not being cruel in calling Peter and Andrew at their father's boat. He's not being cruel. He's not like a ha ha, I'm more important than your dad. It's that I want to get to the root of your life so that your life is actually focused and fixed on me and nothing else. Because I believe that I can show you the right way. I can make you new people. I can create out of myself and my ministry and my power and my spirit, I can create the new humanity, the kingdom of God on earth. Do you know that's what we're called to? The kingdom of God on earth. As in heaven, so in earth. That's our prayer from the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done on earth as in heaven. We're supposed to be creating heaven in God's people on earth. That's what we're here for. To recreate God's will and desire from the heavenly and move it to here. We're supposed to be what the world was intended to be. And when we fail, when we backbite and fight and have disunity and disharmony and all the things that we all get wrapped into and we get there we get to those places where why are we this way we feel defeated because we know what God's trying to produce in us is the new humanity we're trying to reset and recalibrate what God's intention was no less that's the stakes and if that outcome is anywhere near the realm of possibility, he has to be dead center of each of our focus. 
If you miss it by a degree today, it's a mile in 10 years. I had a friend one time. He was my brother-in-law's cellmate. My brother-in-law was in jail for almost eight years. And we used to write him letters and send pictures and we'd go see him. And his cellmate said to him one time, who, who, who is that? He said, it's my sister. He said, why is she dressed like that? He said, I don't know, they're Christians. And we'd send him letters and we'd send him pictures and we'd go to visit him. And every time we'd be there and every time we'd send him something, he would ask my brother-in-law, what, who are those people? Why are they like that? And finally got frustrated. He said, I don't know. Why don't you ask them? And so he said, could I? He said, yeah, yeah, sure. So his cellmate wrote me a letter. He said, hey, I'm your brother-in-law's cellmate. I'm very curious who you people are. What's going on? So we started writing to him, started talking to him. Children started sending him letters. And when he got out of prison, a couple of years before my brother-in-law did, I was there to meet him. And he eventually moved into our community and lived with us. He went to church with us. He went to our prayer meetings. He went street preaching, got married, started having children. But his life was always a roller coaster. Like it was always up and down for years. He either wanted to be out street preaching or shooting dope. Like, he only had two speeds. And it was just like, boom, 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 boom. Like, his whole life was that way. And it was dizzying to watch, much less to live. And every time he would fail, you know, he'd come back to the church, and we'd sit down, and we'd pray, and we'd talk, and he'd repent, and he'd come back to the church. And we'd say, man, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? He'd say, I don't know. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. And eventually, he disappeared. Just up and left. And <clears throat> somebody said, where's, where's brother so-and-so? I don't know. He's not at his house? Nope. He hasn't been there for days. I said, well, we better find him. So I started looking for him, calling people, calling old contacts, going by the places he used to hang out, checking, driving by dope houses, looking up his old acquaintances, trying to find him. I finally tracked him down to a hotel, a motel. And I knew he was there. He'd been gone for a couple weeks, him and his wife. And I found out where he was, and I went and knocked on the door, and they wouldn't answer. And I knocked on the window, and he wouldn't answer. And I knocked on the door some more, and he wouldn't answer. And I kept knocking on the door, and he still wouldn't answer. And I finally started yelling and making a scene in front of the motel. And I said, Eric, it's me. You know I'm not going anywhere. I'll sleep on your I'll sleep in front of this door. You're gonna there's no out. You gotta face me eventually. And he finally reluctantly opened the door. And I went in and they had been they'd been shooting dope and it was a mess. And he sat on the bed, on the end of the bed, and I sat on a chair, and I said, what are you doing? Why are you wasting your life? Like, why, why can't you get free of this? And he just began to sob. And he said, Matthew, I, I watch you and the brothers, and it works for you, but it doesn't work for me. I'm trying, I'm trying so hard. 
And I believe that the Bible's true. I believe that I believe that everything it says is true. I believe in Jesus. I believe all this stuff, but I can't make it work. Like I just get to this place where I'm just pulled more than I can resist and I finally give up and then I'm miserable if I do and I'm miserable if I don't and no matter what I do it always falls apart and he said I don't know what the difference is between you and me I don't know why we believe the same thing but I can't make it work and you can and I told him I do know why it works for me and it doesn't for you see the difference is this you believe certain things are true and you learn those things from the Bible and you feel like you have to do what's right. And that's how you try to run your life. Like the Bible says this, I have to do it. I said, I said friend, that's not why I do the things that I do. It's not how I live my life. The way I live my life is that at a certain point in time, I met Christ and I fell madly in love with him. I love everything about him. I love the way he talks and he thinks and he moves. I love everything he did. And every time I read the scriptures, I'm continually impressed. No matter how many times I read the stories of Jesus, every time they strike me as new and scandalous and dangerous and impactful. And no matter, even if I have it, even if it's verses I've memorized in my heart and my mind, they always surprise me because he's never like me. He's always the target that moves and I can't ever figure out exactly where he is. And I know that I can spend the rest of my life just following him and never be bored, never be dissatisfied, never be out, out, out of passion for who he is. And the things that I do, I don't do because the Bible says they're right. The things that I do, I do because I love Jesus. And I want to please him. I want to be where he is. I want to do what he does. My motive is not to be right. My motive is to be like Christ. And those are worlds apart. They can look very similar for a time. But the one can hold you and the other can't. And brothers and sisters, I think that's the real bottom of the line definition of a disciple. When the logos is the center and everything else makes sense from this place. The problem with preachers is that we idealize. This is our job, right? We're supposed to talk about the ideal. We're looking at the scriptures. These are eternal things. It's the things of God. I mean every word I just said, but I don't mean it's easy. I don't mean that there aren't competitions from my heart and my affection. I don't mean that there aren't times that I have to repent and see that I'm off course. I don't mean that that never makes it, that makes it so I'm never out of sync with the logos. In fact, the more you mean that, the more you are a disciple, the more you'll see where you are out of sync with the logos. But it's about focus. Jesus says, if thine eye be single, thy whole body should be full of light. And this is exactly what he means. When Jesus stays the center, when he's the focus, when your focus is right, your whole body can be full of light. But if your eye is not single, and this is the point I'm trying to make, if your eye is not single, if it's Jesus plus my ideas plus my tradition plus my plus my plus my that doesn't keep that stuff it just has to be in the right priority I'm not saying let me say it this way our traditions do matter, our culture matters, our family matters. A lot of these things matter, and they matter very much. But they don't matter primarily. The one thing that has to stay in the center is Jesus. And then we can call ourselves disciples.
I'm almost out of time, but I want to make one more point so that we can move on from this place. If we go back to that passage in Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus calls Peter and Andrew, we've talked a lot about how this scale, you know, of my life versus Jesus. And I think that's an important way to frame the issue of discipleship. But it's interesting to me the way that Jesus plays with words. He goes to these fishers. It says in the text they were fishers. And he says, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And the thing that matters about that to me is that even though we're staking our life and our identity and our ambitions and who we are, our whole self on the one side of the equation, we're saying, I'm willing to write that off in order to follow Jesus. When we make that decision, Jesus is, he doesn't burn all that stuff. He wants to redeem it. He wants to give it its proper valuation. He wants to fix it and make it exactly what it can be. So like I have my certain, like my personality, my strengths and my weaknesses, just the natural person that I am. Everybody has them. Because we're made in the image of God, we all have strengths. We all have some beautiful things about who we are as individuals, our identity and, and the way we live in the world and the things that we bring to our relationships. These are wonderful things because they come from our being made in the image of God. They're all little, like if you break God into a million little pieces. We have these little fragments of him that are part of us. And those things are wonderful and they're beautiful. All of us have them. All humans have them. God doesn't want you to not be you. He wants you to be the redeemed version of you. Okay, you're a fisher. That's cool. I can use fishers. I just need you to fish men. I want you to be fishers. Just be fishers of men. And that like tie, that connection from their old life to their new life is something really gracious and beautiful to me. It's comforting to me to know that if I, if I am willing, if I'm willing to be a disciple, if I'm willing to let go of myself, he's not doing that to my harm. He wants to take the things out of that pile that I left behind and make them what he wants me to be. And who I am gets to come over. I get to be me still. It's me that he wants to redeem. He doesn't want me, to, he doesn't want, he doesn't, baptism is our entrance, right? Baptism is the most enigmatic, amazing, beautiful thing. Because here's the deal. You become a living sacrifice, right? Not a dead sacrifice. Not the cut them on, let them bleed around on the altar. Not that kind of sacrifice. Living sacrifice. It's both. It's alive and a sacrifice. That's weird. The reason it works is because, you, so we go into baptism, we die with him. This is way off subject and we're almost out of time. In, 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 in Peter it says that in the flood, there were eight souls that were saved. The like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a clear conscience towards God. That makes no sense. How, how, how is baptism like the flood? <coughs> if I was going to write that text, I'd say, the ark wherein eight souls were saved. The like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us, right? Because those eight souls aren't saved in the flood. They're saved in the ark. That's the way I would write that, but that's wrong. It's actually written right. Those souls were saved in the flood. Everything that went under God's judgment and wrath went under the water, and everything that was redeemed came above the water. When you go into baptism, everything that God is judging, condemning, and destroying goes under the water. But you come up. You go down and you go up. You're judged and redeemed. This is beautiful stuff. And that's the fishers of men pr principle. You can be a fisher. You can be who you are. You can be what God made you to be. You can have your personality. You can have the things that God made you, the things that, that are right about you, the things that are beautiful about you, the things that come from your place as God's creation, your self and your personhood is redeemable. 
God doesn't want to make you somebody else. He wants to make you the Christ-like version of you. That's a really hopeful thing. I want you, as we wrap up here, I want you to be conscious. I want you to be conscious of this question, this thought experiment that we did. What are you different than you would be as a Christian? What would you be without him? And what have you staked on the altar? What have you given up of yourself? I think there should be real concrete answers to that question. I think there should be something definite that you know, like if I wasn't a Christian, I would X, Y, and Z. And I'm not those things because Jesus has made me something different. That ought to be a real tangible thing in your life. Okay, the rest of the week we'll focus on more aspects of how to continue and remain in this place. I wanted to start with a definition, a proper definition of terms and think about what a disciple is. Now we'll talk about the rest of the week on how we stay in that place and refine that place and become what Jesus wants us to be. Thank you for your time and your attention.